So we're in this series, Grace and Faith. Grace and Faith. And, and it's embracing what Jesus, what Jesus has, has provided. And, it, and, we, and the Scripture that we've been using throughout this series is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And it says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So there, there's a grace that God has given that has brought salvation to who? Everyone. The whole world. For God so loved the world that He sent His Son. Grace has come. Grace has a face. Grace has a name. And it's Jesus. Jesus is the grace of God. Jesus is the power of God. Jesus is the, the salvation of God. Jesus is our all and all. And he gave it to us by grace, independent of anything that we provided or did. He, d- he provided it all independently of us. And, and, but, but we are saved by faith and grace. And this faith is not of yourselves. See, when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, we, we just prayed about that, that living, that living word. That living word carries with it the faith of God. The faith of Christ. Right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And, and that, that it's actually a more correct translation of that is faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that carries the power of faith. So not only did God provide salvation by grace, and salvation is more than just a ticket to heaven. Salvation is, we live in salvation. We live in the sozo of, of God. We live, it, we live in the very life of God. And, and, and he not only has He by grace provided salvation, but He also by grace provided the faith. Faith always comes. So you only have one choice when it comes to getting saved. And that's unbelief. You can only choose to unbelieve. And that's the same thing that Christians do after they get saved. You either embrace by faith the grace of God to live this life, or you live in unbelief. See, you can have faith and unbelief at the same time. Because faith is of the Spirit. And you carry faith with you all the time. But unbelief is from the unrenewed mind. From our mind. From the natural world. You cannot get unbelief from God. You can only get unbelief from the world. Right? And sometimes you have to choose to unbelieve, to not believe the things of the world. Those bad reports. The things that they say that you're going to fail. That the doctor gives you a bad bad report. That the things that they want to tell you about the economy. All of these things, why don't we choose to not believe those? And believe the promises of God. Right? So there's some good unbelief you can have. So we see that salvation needs two ingredients. Salvation needs two ingredients. It needs grace and faith. You have to have them both. We are not saved by grace alone, and we are not saved by faith alone, but a combination of both. And, and we're being, I'm intentionally being repetitive in, in, this, in this series. The reason why is because people are so indoctrinated with religion. They are. When something bad happens in their life, they, they either say one or two things. Well, it couldn't have happened if God didn't allow it. Or, I have to do something to get God's blessing to flow in my life. So, that, see, that's grace. Either God's controlling everything, or it's what we do, faith, that I have to manipulate, bend the arm of God, pray more, 
seek God more, do all these things so that the, the, the blessing can flow in my life. And it's neither one of those. It's not grace alone and it's not faith alone. It's both grace and faith that gives us the victorious life. See, grace is what God has done. Grace is what God has done. Grace is God's empowerment. This is what grace, grace is what God has done for all humanity. It's God's provision. Um, some, sometimes it's translated, it's the favor of God. It's a favor of God on mankind. It, it's, it's, the power, it's the power of God. It's, it's having everything that we need met by God independently of anything that we had to do with, do with it. And that's what the New Testament is all about. The New Testament is about a covenant. Under, understand this. Testament means a covenant. We had the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We had the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament was dependent, was dependent on God and man. God gave his laws, and he says, if you keep my laws, then you'll be blessed. But if you fail to keep my laws, then you'll be cursed. That's a covenant, not of grace, but of the flesh and of works. Do good, get good, do bad, get beat. And there's a lot of Christians that are still living underneath that covenant. This new covenant was established not with God and, and humanity, but God and one human, Jesus Christ. God became a human and in his humanity made covenant with God. And by faith, we get to enter into that, to the grace that He has provided in that covenant. Amen. And what's so great about this, it's no longer do good, get good, do bad, get beat. It's look unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. That's why, that's why communion, that's why we, we offer communion constantly. Because when, if you take communion right, you're constantly looking to Jesus. You're re putting yourself into remembrance of what He has done and what He has accomplished and what He has provided. And what is so awesome about this is, is that Jesus will never break His covenant with God. And God will never break His covenant with Jesus. And because neither one of them will break the covenant, it's an everlasting covenant. And we get to enter into that. Not by the things that we do, but by simply embracing what God has provided by faith. We get to become children of God. And in this covenant, we literally do become children of God. Why? Because He sends His Spirit to us. And we become new creations in Christ Jesus. You, you need to understand this. Is that in you, if you're born again, and just because you've been coming here for a long time, I, I'm, I'm not going to... Take for granted that you're born again. And you're saying, Chad, are you getting me to question my salvation? Yeah. If you can question it, you should. You should know without a doubt that I'm born again, that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I have the Spirit of God living in me. And renew your mind to who you are now in Christ. This, your, the Spirit of God is living in you and it, it's causing our spirit to cry out, Abba, Father. And that word Abba means Daddy. Daddy. Again, that goes back to the intimacy that God wants you to have with Him. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that are denying the Spirit of God because in their pride, they will not allow themselves to see God as their daddy. But the Spirit lives in us. And we are children of God. And, and we have a grace that has been provided to us in Christ Jesus to live this life completely different than, 
those that are still in Adam's, those that are still have not embraced Jesus Christ, those that have not became new creations. We have so much available to us, but yet we choose to live just like the world instead of being dependent on the grace of God. And we've spent time focusing on the d- dangers of taking grace to an extreme. And what do I mean by taking grace to the, to the extreme? It's this idea that, that you know, grace is what God does, right? And it's this idea that God does everything. That God is in control of everything. Where, where, where they get this idea that people are predestined to eternal bless, bliss or eternal, eternal hell. And that, and that could be even here on earth. That, that some people are, are just blessed in this life and other ones God's just chose to curse in this life. That this choice is made for them independently from any will of their own. That they had no choice in the matter. That God controls it all. And I don't know about you, but I don't know how anyone can read in, in, in 1 John about that God is love and then get the idea that God chooses independently from our will to do harm, and to even to the extreme, extremity of sending someone to hell for eternity. See, we get goofy when we come into the church building. We stop using common sense. Words no longer mean what they mean when they're out, out in the world. Even an unsaved person knows what love is. And that's why they have such a hard time, and that's why they reject God is the way that the Christian's religion has showed him to be. That, 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 that he, is this one, he is the one that's causing hurricanes. He's the one that's causing earthquakes. He's the one that causes babies to be deformed. He's the one that causes sickness and disease. He's the one that's doing all these things. And then they say, isn't he lovely? Come and worship him. No, that's a monster. See, if we get sick, it's God's will. If we're successful, it's God's will. If we're poor, it's God's will. If our marriage ends, God's responsible for it. No, God's not responsible for it. You're a jerk. You're just a jerk. You know, you know, everybody's talking, revival's a big thing that a lot of people are talking about nowadays. And, and I love revival, but, but understand, revival has to translate into kingdom living. You can't live in revival. God never designed us to live in revival. He designed us to live in the kingdom. And we got people that want miracles. They want to see the, the people heal. They want to see people come out of wheelchairs. They want to see... See, uh, blind eyes open, deaf ears open. And yes, I want to see all that too. That's part of the kingdom. But you, you can't be wanting that on one hand and then be a total jerk to your family on the other hand. To be a jerk in the world, to be no, they will know that we are Christians by our love. See, that's just the thing of it is, is how, do, how, does, how does revival translate into life? Doing life in the kingdom. If we lose our job, it couldn't happen. If God didn't allow it, well, maybe you not, you not showing up for work had something to do with it. Maybe your lazy work ethic had something to do with it. Maybe that you're always complaining and griping had something to do with it. You understand? When we say those things, what, it, what kind of testimony it is for God, God, and we take no responsibility for the things that have happened in our life, 
God gets the blame for everything. And I understand why pastors preach this way. Because that's easy. It's, it'd be so wonderful if I could, you come to me with your problem and I could just blame it on God. Instead of looking you yourself in the face and say, look, you did this, this, and this. I would have fired you too. <laughs> Why does bad things happen? Well, we never know. God, God's ways are higher than our ways. Who can know the mind of God? The New Testament says, it uses that scripture and says, you have the mind of Christ. See, this, this, this idea is complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense and it's not found in scripture. But, th- but there are those on the other side of the ditch. Those that think that it's all about faith, what we must do, that our faith somehow moves God. It gets God to do something, which is not found in Scripture either. You understand that? you got people that say that God's always in control. He's in control of everything. And then you got people that are, we need to pray more. We need to bombard the gates of heaven. We, we, need to, we need to get God to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Jesus is the, do- the window of heaven. He is Jacob's ladder. He, Jesus has, the, the heavens are open. And God is pouring out His grace on all that will receive it. And that, again, this grace is not just for salvation. It's for living life. Are you believing it? Are you embracing the grace of God? See, it's a combination of grace and faith that causes the power of God to be released in our lives. Understand that grace or faith taken by themselves are disastrous. It's just a disastrous doctrine. And there's been two camps, the Arminians and the Calvinists, that's been fighting over this for years. And they're both wrong. It's both of them. You will not have the life of God. You will not have the power of God. You will not have the grace of God manifesting in your life if you do not apply faith to His grace. And that brings salvation. Look, look. See, if God is controlling everything, what is the point of anything? Right? What's the point of anything? Why are we, why are we meeting today? This has to be one of the worst doctrines ever invented by men. What's the point of seeking God? What's the point of seeking Him if He controls everything and you have no part to play in this world, in your life? Why pray? What's the sense of praying? It would be a complete waste of time studying the Word or even going to church. After all, what will be, will be. Que sera, sera, right? Because it's all up to God anyways. See, what people don't understand is that God, in the Garden of Eden, delegated authority to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve lost that authority when they bowed their knee to Satan. And then Jesus came back as a man and took back that authority. And now He has all authority both in heaven and on earth. And then He turned around and gave it right back to us, to the church. And now we are the ambassadors of Christ. What is an ambassador? We are a represent, rep- representative of what? Jesus, a king. We are a representative of a kingdom. We represent Jesus. Ask yourself, How good of a representative are you? What kind of kingdom do you represent? What kind of image do you give to people? We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. See, there's a large segment of the body of Christ that allows the enemy to control their lives. They allow their enemy to control their lives by believing that it's all up to God. 
that God does, has, is in control and does everything. See, they fail to walk in this de- delegated authority that Jesus has given us. And instead of experiencing his abundant life, they allow the devil to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy in their life. We need to get understand and get to a, a, a complete understanding that when things happen in our life that we, we do not like, that we don't desire, when there's the storms of life, and we, we're asking God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why, why, is, it, why is this happening? And, and it's an accusation against God. If you will listen, you will hear God saying back to you exactly, why are you allowing this to happen? You have been given the authority in Christ Jesus. In James 4, 7, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is a responsibility. This is James. This is the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, right? This is James, and he's saying that you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility in this earth. See, if God was in control of everything... You wouldn't need to be told to resist the devil. You would not be needed to be told to submit to God. See, some things are, are from God. Do you know that there's some things that happen in your life that are from God? And there's other things, according to this, that aren't from God. So there are things happening in the earth that are not God's will. Some things are from the devil. Some things are nothing more than your own personal fault. See, that's another thing is that people people think that the devil's attacking me. No, you're doing a pretty good job of destroying your life by yourself. The truth is, everything bad that has ever happened in your life is either... See, this is what people don't want to hear. Is either the choices that you have made or allowing Satan to have dominion over you. Look what Peter shows us in 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Now, when it says be sober, he's not talking about alcoholic beverages, he's talking about in your mind, be sober in your thinking. And most religious people are drunk in their thinking. They do not have a sober mind. And then he says to be vigilant. You have to be sober. You have to be vigilant. God's not going to do it for you. Why? Why is he telling us to do this? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Does it say that God's going around making bad things happen? Is it, is it saying that God's the devourer? No, it's saying that the devil. The devil walks around and he's looking for someone to devour. You have to choose to be sober. You have to choose to be vigilant. Notice that it, it, it says that, that He's looking for someone to devour. That means that there's some people that he's not able to devour. There are some people that he's not able to attack. And one of the greatest things, one of the greatest things about, um, you know, you can, it says you can see, you can see God in creation. In the animal planet, you ever watch Animal Planet? And, and when I was a kid, it was a lot more brutal than it is, is today, Right? When, when that lion came at, after the, that herd of zebras, what do they do? They come up and they're looking, right? What are they looking for? They're looking for the weakest ones. They're looking for the, for the, for the ones that don't have much strength. The ones that, that, they look for ones that they can get away from the herd. That they can get away. And what's one of the first things that Satan does to believers when they get offended, when they get when they, they separate them from 
the congregation, the church. And Satan looks just like these lions. He's looking for those that are weak in the spirit, weak in faith, those, those that are completely of the flesh, those that are com- completely um, not embracing the grace of God, those, those that aren't, aren't walking in fellowship with God, those, those that are in bitter, bitterness, those that are in um, um, habitual sin, those, those that are in... Uh, um, unforgiveness, all of, these, all of these things are things that allow Satan to come into your life and to rob, kill, and destroy. They make you weak in faith towards God. And what do they do? They go after the weak ones. He can't, they can't go after the strong ones. They can't go after the, the ones that, are, that, that stay together in, in, the, in the pack. See, this is a perfect example of what Satan does. He's looking for who he can go after. See, the devil cannot devour everyone. And he can't do things to you without your consent and cooperation. Do you know that? People need to know that. If you say, well, the devil's doing this to me, the devil's devil's wreaking havoc in my life, you're actually saying that I'm allowing Satan to Rob, kill, and destroy in my life. Anywhere that you are being stolen from in your life is you allowing Satan to do so. He has no authority over you except what you have allowed him to have. See, this people don't like this stuff. And one of the biggest, biggest open doors people give to the devil is, is the attitude, well, this couldn't be happening if it wasn't God's will. What an open door. That we're not even saying that the devil's doing it to us. We're saying that God's doing it to us. And it couldn't happen unless it was God's will. And so if it's God's will, how can we fight against it? How can we resist? How can we be vigilant if God's the one that's willing it to happen in our life? So that opens the door for him to rob, kill, and destroy. See, we are commanded to resist the devil. But if God's doing it to you, why would you ever resist? You know what resist means? It means to actively fight against. You need to be actively fighting against the devil in your life. And everything that is part of his kingdom. It's not even a kingdom. It's just a rogue Vagabonds in the earth. Are you actively fighting? Or are you actively fighting God? Are you submitting to God? Or are you resisting God? Let me ask you a question. Can you limit God? Can you limit God? Can you put limits on the Almighty? Can God be limited? Can you put a limit on God in your life? Could there be things that God actually wills to come to pass in your life that can't happen because he, you won't allow him? Think about this. A lot of people have a hard time answering this. Because they're, they're thinking that, that it, it, it's an affront on God. It's not if this is how God set the system up. See, we have free will because God by His sovereign power, gave it to you. We don't... God, the, by giving you delegated authority over your own personhood, He allowed you to limit Him in your life. You can limit God in your life. God Almighty can be limited in your life. You don't believe me? Look at this. In Psalms 78, verse 41. Yes, again and again they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. It wasn't once. It was time and time again. He's talk, this is talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt in the wilderness. And God wanted to do things in their life. He wanted to take them into the promised land. 
and again and again they murmured, they complained, their hearts were turned back to Egypt. And by fear, they refused to go in. And 40 years they spent in the wilderness. That was 40 years that was not the will of God. See, the Lord is not forcing His will upon us individually or collectively as a nation or a people group. See, a lot of religious people need to get off their holy derrieres and and look at our country and not think that it's going to hell in a handbasket just because God's wills it. We see here that the children of Israel were the ones that limited God God from doing what He willed to do in their life, in their nation. You have to cooperate. You have to partner with God, with Him, to see His will to come to pass in your life. And a nation has to cooperate. They have to partner with God to see His will come to pass in their nation. And that's how this nation was birthed. Men coming together in cooperation with God. See, we see this again in Deuteronomy. God's will was for the Israelites to have absolute victory. He promised them that their enemies would be delivered into their hands. But there is a caveat. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 15, it says, And the Lord will take away from you all sickness, and he will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on all those that hate you. Also you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eyes shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them. You, you shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well that the Lord your God, what, you, what, your, what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. It says, if you shall say in your heart, these natures, na- nations are greater than I, who is the you? Who is the your in that, in the, in that sentence? The children of Israel, right? The children of Israel is the you. If the children of Israel should say in their heart, these nations are greater than them, right? Then it says, how can I dispossess them? Who is the I in this sentence? God. God is the one, by His grace, is empowering the children of Israel to dispossess those those people in those lands. God is telling Israel that I promise you victory. No one will be able to stand against you. You'll win every battle. Everything's going to work. But if you say in your heart and get into unbelief, how can I dispossess them? Does this have any correspondence to our own life today? God wants you to prosper. He wants you to succeed. But if you say in your heart, I'm just a failure, nothing works for me, how can I prosper you, the Lord says. See, you're a double-minded man. You understand this revelation. Double-mindedness. You have to have two minds to be double-minded. Do you have two minds? You have the mind of Christ. In your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. But in your soul, you have your mind. When your mind is in unbelief, and the mind of Christ is in faith, you're double-minded. It's only when our mind is renewed through the Word of God, and we come into partnership with what God says is true, what God has promised, 
Then we come into singularity of mind. And we receive from God. See, we, we li- we're, li- we're still living in this fallen world. We still have an enemy that's looking to rob, kill, and destroy. We have to partner with God. We've seen that Jesus even partnered with God. Jesus made statements, and we don't under- we, I don't think we really understand them. He says, I only say the things that I hear my Father saying, I only do the things that my Father's doing. Was that just for Jesus? Or was he being singular in mind? I do not have a will independent from the will of my Father. I don't have a desire that's independent from the desire of my Father. My Father gives me the desires of my heart. What does that look like? See, what does that look like for a fisherman? Or a farmer? What does that look like for a business owner today? Or a teacher? Or a, a politician? Or a mother? Or a father? What, what does it look like? See, it, God has a will for each one of us. And we have to come into partnership with that. And that's where we find life abundance. Life everlasting, overflowing, fulfillment, contentment. Is when you come into God's perfect will for your life. And you know without a shadow of doubt that this is what I was born for. This is why I was created. God gets much glory from my life because I'm doing exactly what he's called me to do. But the problem with us, I'm getting ahead of myself. The problem is, is that so many of us will say, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Yes, you do. But the problem is, is when he revealed it to you, it took faith and you said, I can't do it. And you forgot about it. You put it down. Listen, the will, what God has planned for your life takes faith. But the good news is, He also supplies the grace. He supplies the grace, and all you've got to do is embrace it by faith. See, God is telling, telling Israel he, that I promise you victory, and everything's going to work out. But how can I do it? How can I do it if you're in unbelief? If you're not trusting me? See, God cannot bring deliverance in your life just like the children of Israel if you yield to fear through unbelief and doubt. Unbelief stops the power of God from flowing in your life. Can you see how important this is? This isn't just about going to heaven one day. This is why why Christ came, so that we might have abundance. His abundant life. By belief that God controls everything is actually limiting what really is God's will for your life. By you believing that when bad things happen to you and your station in life and who you are is all by the will of God, you're actually limiting the will of God in your life. You're you're the one that is stopping God from being God in your life. You're the one that's stopping God from becoming all that he intended to be in your life because you embraced the lie of the enemy. You're embracing the enemy that's coming to rob, kill, and destroy, and you're saying, this is my Abba. This is my daddy. See, that's the problem. Religious people have a hard time with intimacy with God. They have a hard time with knowing God as their Abba, as their daddy, because there's no way you could believe that garbage if you knew God as your daddy. Look how grace and faith played out in the life of Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, it says, For I am the least of the apostles, whom am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. See, this is quite a statement. This is from a man that wrote half of the New Testament. This is from a man that probably did more missionary journeys and set up more churches than any any of the apostles. He says that he is not worthy to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church. Who was he when he persecuted the church? He was Saul. He was looking at himself in the flesh. He was looking 
He loved God when he was persecuting the church. Do you know that? But he wasn't, he was fighting against the very will of God. This is a man that's seen the dead raise, that walked in miracle power, that's seen God move in in, in mighty ways. But Paul understood that none of these were accomplished by who he was or what strength he had in the flesh, but that it was all by the grace of God. That's why he said that he was not even fit to be called an apostle. He's not fit to be called an apostle because we have nothing to offer God in our flesh. None of us are are fit to be called children of God because we have nothing to offer God in our flesh. You have nothing to offer God. You have nothing to offer God. And that's all religion has, is is to tell you what you need to offer God. You might as well admit it right now. I have nothing. I have nothing (laughs) to offer God. So what does that mean? That means God has everything to offer you. God has everything to offer you. That's that dependence that you become on God's grace. You're dependent on God's grace. And this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, I am nothing. I am nobody. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. He's not just being religiously humble. Because look what he goes on to say. But by the grace of God, I am that I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. See, there's grace towards all of us. There's grace towards you. Question, is it in vain? Why is it in vain? But Because I labored more abundantly than they all. So Paul goes from saying, I'm not even worthy to be an apostle. Oh, he's being so humble to being so prideful that I labor, I've done more than them all. No, you got to understand what he's saying there. He's saying that me, by myself, independently, in the flesh, I have nothing to offer God. I am not even worthy to be called an apostle. But because of the grace of God put in my life, I did not take that grace in vain. <laughs> but I labored more than they all. What, how did he labor more than they all? Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul gave all credit to God and said it's all by God's grace, God's unmerited favor and ability, which is available to him and to you and to us. And this grace is made made Paul who he is. See, he did not allow, he did not allow the grace of God to be be taken in vain. It was not given to him in vain. But what did he do? He seen the grace of God that was available to him, and by faith he embraced it, and he labored more than they all. And this is why we're talking about Paul today. Because God gave grace and he accepted it. Remember, grace is what God does for us, independently from us. It's not based on our performance. By grace, God God has already provided forgiveness of sins. He's already provided healing. He's already provided deliverance. He's already provided joy, peace, love, and even faith. God has provided it all for you through the grace of Jesus Christ. Everything that God is and has has already, past tense, been accomplished and provided to you by grace. It's already yours. But as awesome as, as this is, grace alone, knowing that God has provided it, grace alone will not bring transformation unless there is a response to that grace. And that response to that grace is a response of faith. And that's our part. We choose to believe it. We choose to accept it. And faith without works is dead. And this is what it's saying, that Paul believed the grace of God. He trusted the grace of God. And he added a life of works to that grace. And he labored more than they all. 
See, this is the po- point that Paul is making. He, he, everything, he understood that God provided everything to him by grace. But he embraced that grace by faith and labored more abundantly than they all. And it was not by his strength, but by the grace of God that he was, that was available to him. You know, there's, there's things in my life that, that I could see in unbelief. I, I, I hesitated and I, I went multiple, multiple years before actually working to become into, to get into the ministry in a deeper way than just being a lay minister in the church. Because I didn't think I was qualified, I didn't think it was good enough, and it was my fear and unbelief. I did not trust in the grace of God. And there's some of you that God has ordained to be business owners. And God wants to funnel resources through, you, through, through what He has planned for your life. But because of fear and unbelief, you don't step out in that. There are those that are waiting to start a family because they don't think they're, they have enough resources or funds or whatever, but in their heart they want to start a family. You understand, God's grace is there. When God gives you a desire in your heart, He... Understand something. He would not give you the desire if He did not already provide everything you needed for that desire to be met. And the thing of it is, is, is that that desire, it's the problem is, is that to, to, to go through, the, the desire is through a door that's dark. And you've got to take a step in the unknown and trust that God's going to light your path everywhere he goes why because it takes faith you're not going to do it in your own strength it takes faith and you step out in partner partnership with god you young people god god has put things in your hearts you see things in our world you think you 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 have these ideas that you could be a change in in our world in our community that you could be a change in your schools you can be a change in co- in college and universities you, you you could be a uh, you can bring new re- revelation to to science the sciences and the medical fields and education and and the in in business and all of the in technology all of these things the arts and entertainment there's things that God has put in your heart and he's already provided the grace for them to be accomplished. But because it doesn't seem prog- pragmatic, is that right? Is that the right word? doesn't seem logical. And you have people in your life say, well, you'll never make any money doing that. I had someone say that to me once. You are... The grace that God has provided for you to be everything that he's called you to be, to be a world changer, to be an ambassador for him in this earth, for the kingdom of God. Everything that God has provided is in vain because you are not embracing it by faith. You know, in Ephesians it says God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. You ask or think. Do you believe that? Everybody believes it. Everybody believes that God is able to do that. But is it His will to do that? Well, what's the very next Scripture? According to the power that works in you. That power that works in you is the faith of God in that supply. It's grace and faith. And I don't care how old you are. You, you silver-haired saints, you can't get out of this either. God has a plan and destiny for your life too. And you know, Paul wrote to Timothy, it says, uh, do not, he said to him, don't, look, let, don't, let, don't look, let them look down on you for your, your youth. Well, we're living in a culture where it seems that we are not honoring our elders. And I'm here to say, don't allow the world to look down on you for your age. Your, 
Boldness. What do you say? What's the opposite of youth? Boldness? Maturity? I don't know about that. But <laughs> do you understand that? There is a grace on your life. If you have air in your lungs, there's a grace on your life, and God has a destiny and purpose for you. He, and he has already provided everything you need to accomplish what he's called you to do. Are you going to embrace it by faith? I, I, I don't want to... I, do a, I got a lot of stuff going on in my life. And I constantly say, it's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. And I understand this completely, that I am what I am by the grace of God. God's grace is amazing. It's so amazing what He is able to do in our lives if we will just embrace it by faith. If we'll step out. See, all these truths, all these truths that we talked about today are just available to, today to us as it was to the early church. And understand something. We, 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 what we've got to understand is Paul wasn't just a preacher. He was a business owner. He had a, he had a tent manufacturing business. He met Priscilla buying fabric. So she was a dyer, she dyed fabric, purple fabric, right? How did he meet her? Through a business transaction. He was buying fabric. And these tents weren't tents like we think of going camping in a tent. All the marketplaces, all the businesses were set up as tents. This was a he was a commercial businessman. And listen. When we're talking about these things, for some reason, everybody's minds go to just what God's calling them to do in the church. This building is not the church. You're the church. And it's time that the church gets out of the building and allow the grace of God to be manifest in the earth. God has a call for each one of you. God has a desire for each one of you. You, and this goes back to Sunday's message. You need to be intimate with God. You need to be intimate with Jesus. You need to spend time with Jesus. And ask Him, what is my purpose? What is my destiny? And I guarantee you there's going to be something that comes up in your, your mind and you're going to say, I don't want to do that. It's not that you don't want to do that. It's like, I don't see how that's ever going to happen. There are so many people that's given up on the dreams that God has given them. Why? Because the grace of God was in vain. They said in their heart, they, they said in their heart, how can we stand against this enemy? How can we stand against this? How can we do this? And God's not able to dispossess the land for them. See, there's a rest. There's a rest in Jesus Christ where, where you take on his yoke and his burdens light. And we rest in, in, the, in the unforced rhythms of His grace. And we're able to look like we work harder than anybody else. But we don't feel like we've worked harder than anyone else. Because it's the grace of God that does the work for us. It's time for the church to have an awakening. An awakening. Leave our stupor. Leave, get sober thinking. And understand that God loves this world. God loves this world. Do you know that this world will never perish? Do you know that this is our eternal dwelling? You could be living your heaven on earth right now if you choose to embrace His grace. Do you know that when Jesus comes back and, the, and, the, and Satan and death and hell is thrown into the lake of fire, that you will never have an opportunity to say, I trust my daddy. 
I stand in faith in what my daddy provided. Now is the time when God gets to show Himself strong in the midst of persecution, in the midst of an enemy that's looking to rob, kill, and destroy, in the midst of other people that, that do not want to see the plans and the things of God prevail in this earth. Now is our time. Now is our time for the glory of God to be released in the earth. Now is the time for the church, I don't know who it is, but to come up with the answers to the, to the biggest problems in, in this earth. Do you, do you know how many scientists... I can't get off on all this. The reason why we're, I, reason why we're here today is because in, in America is because God spoke to an individual that there is a there, that there is another world out there and by faith he embraced that call and stood against science and stood against all the wisdom of man of that day and sailed into the unknown and found the new world found America Americas God supplied that grace and he embraced it by faith and that's the truth that <laughs> was he a perfect person no but are you no but in Christ Jesus I am what I am amen amen you've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church for more information or to contact us go to www www.charisntc.org And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.